Hello everyone, thank you very much for joining me. I am Samuel Shepard, the cellist of the Amatis Piano Trio, and also for today, your host of the Zoom In interview as part of the Verbier At Home online festival. Um, in these interviews, we are meeting some of the great artists that grace the stages of Verbier Festival on a regular basis. And today we are meeting Lisa Batiashvili, uh, the incredible violinist from Georgia. And we had a really quite broad and wonderful discussion. I really enjoyed it. Um, we discussed her new CD. We discussed Georgia, uh, the country. <laughs> uh, we also talked about a bit of her sort of musical philosophy and advice and life advice, and even a little bit of football. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy meeting this extraordinary artist. How are you doing? All good? Fine, thank you. How are you? Where are you? Uh, in Salzburg. Okay. You? Okay. I'm in Munich at home. Yeah. Uh, okay. Oh, you're close by. Close by. Yeah, yeah. Very close. <laughs> so thank you so much for joining us. Um, we are doing this for Verbier at home. So what, what better place to start than to kind of talk about Verbier Festival itself. I saw you there in 2018. I was there also with my piano trio. Would you like to share a bit of your sort of thoughts about the festival uh, maybe a highlight or your your best feeling towards it yeah well i think most of the concerts were highlights because i think this is probably uh, one of very very few places in the world where you can uh, come together and perform with uh, your absolute dream uh, musical heroes <laughs> and this is this is what what Revia is famous for uh, anyway and also i love that place because this I, I can take my family and and we're having a wonderful time we don't necessarily play perform every day so this is also a big advantage because you can also have some time off between the concerts so it's always been a great pleasure to be in Revia do you know how many times you've been there uh four times four times yes uh and each time i mean if i would have to choose one mm -hmm. very special moment is then when i performed for the first time actually with my former teacher anna Tumachenko. we did some uh, just a Kovish duos and that was so special i mean this is a moment which i will never forget that's what, yeah very very nice <laughs> very nice i remember in 2018 it was incredible i I think we had a masterclass with Andrew Schiff at lunchtime, just full of all this inspiration. And then we came to one of your concerts and we were listening to incredible musicians till one in the morning. It was such an inspiration to be amongst you guys. It was incredible. Yeah, it's a bit surreal, all of this. And uh, now that we are kind of in a different, um, yeah, completely different new life, uh, I think that all of these things will become even more special because we, we have such memories of all those musical moments, uh, of the freedom of uh, travel and, um, all, and and big audiences and all of this. And I've been thinking about all of the special moments actually in recent weeks a lot and how grateful one can be about all of this. Yeah, have you been back on stage already through this period? Yes, I have been back on stage um, several times. I was, let's say I was lucky because in my area, Munich, uh, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, things are moving forward a little bit faster than in other places. For example, all my concerts in the uh, United States, there were, were 20 concerts for the next uh, couple of months. They're all being cancelled, of course, like for everybody else. But then the, the local things in Europe are kind of moving forward slowly and now I'm for example I had uh, last week uh, concerts first concerts with orchestra again and with a real audience like for mm -hmm. 400 something people in Zurich with mm -hmm. the Tonhalle Orchestra and Pavel Yarvi and it feels like you know what I find really fantastic is that um, so many orchestras and um, organizers are trying everything possible to actually adapt to this new life but still not give up on music live music and I think this is this is this, this will save our business this will save our uh, concept life because you just can't just sit and wait until someone tells you that finally you can start doing concerts again because we need to really challenge each other and the politics and um, everybody else to to find a solution 
Yeah, uh, that, that's well said. I couldn't have said it better myself. And did you feel like the audience was in a in a different place for this? these concerts back like an expectation or excitement or a concentration they maybe didn't have before absolutely and um well my very first concert with audience this um after the during this this the period was in germany and um schloss elmau and then mm -hmm. a couple of other times with very small audiences and now even in zurich i have never experienced such a silent audience in my entire life um I don't think it's only related to the masks, but I think, <laughs> I think it's the fact that people are, you know, only people come to the concerts at this time who really have been missing this, who have really been looking, um, waiting for the day um, to, to be back uh, and listening to the live concerts. And I think for them, because it's such a special moment, they are with you 100%. So, so they just stop coughing, they just stop making any noises and uh, it, it, you feel that it's, it's very special. And it's also, it gives us even more possibility to kind of come together and feel the, the music. There's no distraction because this is something that sometimes can be a little bit difficult when you feel dis uh, distracted by the, by the noises or whatever, too much movement around. Uh, and it really felt uh, like everybody was together. Yeah, I, I've just been writing a blog actually called No One Dared to Cough. We had our first concert back in Berlin yeah. Concert House and couldn't believe yeah. it. The whole time you could hear a, a pin drop in the auditorium. It was incredible. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, it really is. Um, well, you've been at home a lot. So what's quarantine? The day in the life of Lisa in quarantine look like? Yeah. Um, well, I must say, I'm, I'm as a person, um, uh, I, I like being at home also in normal times. So mm -hmm. uh, let's say it's not a punishment for me to spend time at home. It's not uh, something where I would, you know, get um, impatient easily because I also have two children who are in the age where you can do so many things with them. I mean, my daughter is 16 already, but still. You know, the, the life is very active for me mm -hmm. as mom. <laughs> and, and my son is 12. We, of course, we spend a lot of time together doing things without time pressure. That's also one of the things I, I appreciated. Uh, not only the time itself, but, but uh, dealing with the time differently. Uh, because it's one thing to, to be there, but always have so many things on your list to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's something else where you know that so many things are not possible anyway. So why don't you just enjoy whatever you can do? Uh, that was in the, in the first months, I think something that was so different from any other time I, I lived in my life. Uh, and I think it was similar to, for, for everybody else. And now, um, you know, I think uh, now we're getting more or less back to normality. Kids are going back to school next week and, uh, we just, what I realized is that we just become so much more flexible and so much more easygoing about, uh, uh, you know, we are much less of control freaks about um, mm -hmm. what is going, what, what is our life going to look like in one or two years, because it's no, it makes no sense to think about that. I think we need to think about how our life is going to look in two weeks. Um, and because I'm from Georgia and Georgia, people also like to be very spontaneous and last minute. So somehow it reminds me of, of my childhood in uh, when I was a kid and, you know, everything was day by day. And um, yeah, it, 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 it doesn't feel so uncomfortable, but of course it is a very unstable time. And instability is for many people, uh, instability is for many people uh, something scary. And uh, I, I just simply hope that now we will not have this time of going back and forth of, uh, with this virus and too, much, too many question marks, but somehow we will get through this in one way or the other. Um, I'd like to quickly ask you a question about how practice maybe did, been different. Obviously, you're so used to having a concert to prepare for or something like this. Have you, have you found maybe you've ended up unearthing a piece you you don't have to prepare, but just for the, just for the love of it, or has it changed the way you approached your practice at all? 
some things have changed a lot, actually. I mean, I'm, I'm, it's very surprising that um, I suddenly feel new things when I play. And it's not because I practice more. I mean, probably I practice much less even because, because of course, when you don't have concerts, then you practice whenever you want to practice. Um, but I did spend more time with chamber music because I had my chamber music concerts. Uh, I had more, more time to think, to um, try out, let's say, new bowings, new fingerings for for concertos or for pieces that I've played many times. And um, it feels that something new did happen for me while I was playing, because now when I'm going back to all these things, and I feel like it's not only that I feel rested and fresh, it's also that suddenly I have more inner energy. And because, of course, the lifestyle that we have of this nonstop uh, action, and I think also nonstop travel, it does make us tired altogether. So for me personally, it, it felt that now um, I think I have even more pleasure playing the violin and probably I feel that also physically. Um, and practicing at home, it was, yes, I did play more Bach and some, some short things, solo violin stuff that I played for myself as well. But because it was no pressure, it was just also incredibly, it was just, just for myself. It was so nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's... No, it was for you. I mean, it's, it's, everybody feels it different because there are so many colleagues who thought, oh, I, I, I want to play for the audience. So I'm going to record something on the internet and post and do live concerts almost every day. I mean, there, there are people like that as well. But for me, it was also a time to just step back a little bit from this and just um, take yeah. a few. I think it gave us time to ask the kind of why question of why we do it. it I, I've always been quite idealistic and felt like I play because I, I want to, because I love it. Um, I have missed the audience though, uh, hugely. And getting back to playing concerts and obviously the trio repertoire is quite small. So uh, you visit these pieces many times over the years. And yes. it's like visiting an old friend again. It was, everything was fresh and uh, new ears open to everything. And oh, what a feeling. So good. <laughs> um, you've also been really busy because you've got a new CD out, City Lights. Um, before I ask you anything about it, I, I bought some new speakers for myself the other day. <laughs> and they were the first thing on. Um, it's an incredible album. I found it so touching, particularly the, the Chaplin connection. I, maybe I'm a, a bit of a sucker for this, this era of music actually, and this kind of Holly, early Hollywood sound in some ways, and stuff like this. Um, if any listeners haven't heard it, pause this, go listen to that and come back. Um, this looked like an incredible project. What was the inspiration and how did you go about it? Well, thanks, first of all, for your words. It was uh, such a um, long journey for me. So all these nice words are really, <laughs> it feels really good. <laughs> um, yes, and I, I would say also the journey to the past century and this kind of music from the times where things were so different. And we kind of, it feels like in, in these years, recent years, uh, we've been especially nostalgic about 1920s and mm -hmm. all this. I've heard so much about 1920s in the last months and so many films came out or articles in the newspapers. And it was just before the album was out and I was just thinking there's some connection with that. I think it's just intuitively, I probably touch something that people are longing for also uh, in these crazy times, but it was more related to the music that I've loved since my childhood and never really had an occasion to play because you don't just necessarily, you can't really find any sheet music for, uh, for Michel Legrand or even Chaplin and all these things that you want to play, but you want to present them in a new or different way. You don't want to just pick something and make a copy of it. And, and that's why it was a very complex um, project. 
Um, and at the same time, there was this idea to connect these works um, to the places that were important to me um, throughout my life, because there were, there were a few places like that. And I think that we artists become the persons will become not only through our education or our personality, but also through the people we meet, to the places we go, the audiences that inspire us, the orchestras uh, or the other musicians that spend time with us. It's such, a, such an important part of our life. And I wanted to somehow give back the, the, the gratitude and the thanks and love to all these places. And somehow it came together with these two ideas and, um, then the trouble started. <laughs> oh, tell me more. What yeah, does the, that trouble, mean? <laughs> the trouble was to actually compose all of this and make yeah. combinations and find the themes and, and, and clear the rights of the themes that were so protected. And you know, I like was going through, I don't know, a, a thriller. Uh, and, uh, and if you pull all of these things together, you become a part of the new creation, basically. Um, which the is arrangements good. are incredible. Um, yes, I had this really amazing friend who I trusted 100% who lives in Georgia, Nicholas Radrelli, who is a friend from my childhood, and I know how he works. So I, I knew in the moment where he took this project over, basically, to make the arrangements, most of the arrangements. I just trusted him, but still he surprised me by the variety of the arrangements by the variety of the characters because he never repeated himself in, in two different works. Basically, he always offered a new palette of colors and new uh, style and, and, and atmosphere in each of the works. And um, I think I, it was just simply, I will, I'll be very honest with that, without thinking about the, the quality of it or even the result, it was such a joy and pleasure each time to discover all these new pieces that were brought together uh, and to play them. And some of them were ready very last minute just before we went to record them and just discovering together with the orchestra, just like, wow, this sound. I've never had this sound before myself. <laughs> so it was, um, I think it gave me a lot of energy, this uh, album, but it was, as I said, also during the release, a lot of work. Um, and luckily I did have time now to, to do all of this and um, I'm simply very happy that it turned out like this but because this kind of projects can always go a little bit wrong. <laughs> I think that the stunning thing is that the aesthetic for it, the, the aesthetic for beauty throughout it is always, always constant and there's, you can hear that every track is related in terms of your playing in it and the way it's produced um, and yet every single track has completely its own flavor and it kind of jumps out at you in its own way. So the way you've held each track together in an album as well, is it's really remarkable. I love it. And, you know, and thank you. And you know, until the last moment, we didn't know how we would place the tracks because yeah. we had, we had cl pure classical tracks like Bach and Dvorak uh, and we also, and, 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 and uh, Hans Strauss. Of course, and, and then we had the film music, we had some jazz and folklore, and, and I just thought, the, of course, the danger is that you bring these things together and it becomes like a mixture of everything. And I was so pleased to finally find an order where actually Chaplin, Bach, and Le Grand, one after the other, one it wouldn't sound like <laughs> tasteless stuff, but it would actually quite accomplish each other and, and, and make, it, make it colorful, but not, um, not be in conflict. Yeah, it, it, it's not, a lot of CDs that try to do this kind of thing, they can feel kitsch to a sort yeah. of very uh, seasoned classical <laughs> music listener, but you do not suffer from any of that. It's extraordinary. And I wondered, you were playing with a lot of different musical styles and therefore musicians, some incredible, incredibly famous musicians on this as well. Is there someone who kind of leapt out at you and who you maybe took a lot from and found particularly inspiring to work with? Well, of course, all of them. I, I mean, that's just such personalities. I couldn't really <laughs> say anything different. Maybe who surprised me the most was Katie Melua because I had never worked with any pop artists on, a, mm -hmm. on such a level. And of course I knew of her, we had never met, but I knew a lot about her and we had uh, friend, uh, common friends. And 
But what really struck me is that as soon as you have a, a musician, doesn't matter from which style and which genre, but a, a musician that is so devoted and so serious and so honest, then everything can work together. And that was for me a discovery because she was so connected to her lyrics and she came and she wrote that song basically just before we contacted her she had just coincidentally written a song about uh, for london so she offered that song uh, for this album and said if you like it we can record it together and um, what i found really fantastic about her that she came and she read the text uh to the whole orchestra and georgia she had then um uh, 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 read the, the text also in Georgian because she, as you might know she is from Georgia yep, yep. And, and that was so incredible because suddenly everybody played differently and even if this kind of music it's not let's say it's not the most complex music that you, you could play but even in that it's so important to go behind the notes and just find out what this artist wants to say and how he or she wants to say um and at the end for me that was probably the most surprising experience out of all mm -hmm. yeah very nice and well there's a lot of georgia in there um obviously <laughs> a place very close to your heart it's a place i actually i went at the end of last year on a road trip around georgia incredible oh. place it totally blew me away um, Where did you go, if I can ask, because Georgia is small, I, but there's still different places. Yeah, I started in Tbilisi, and yeah. then I drove west, basically. So I went through Kutisi, then up to Racha, is it Racha oh, National yeah. Park? Spent some days there hiking, and then went over to the coast. And um, oh, it was just amazing. And I'm a big food lover. Oh, then you were in the right place for sure. <laughs> oh my God, do you have a favorite dish? I only have favorite dishes. I, I, when I go to Georgia, of course, I miss the country, the people, but probably I have to confess most of everything else that I miss the food. <laughs> <laughs> I miss food and the great wine, which, um, why, I mean, you can find great wine in Europe as well, of course, but the wine in Georgia, if you really find the, the best wine there, it's so natural that it really doesn't feel like you're drinking wine. Um, and I think that, of course, I think food is very important because it is also part of your uh, genetic like heritage and everything that you are about. Because if you, let's say, eat certain food as a child, this it, it somehow it belongs to your entire being. And when I go back to Georgia, I it just feels like there is such a harmony with everything we do there, eat, eat and drink and and. Uh, um, the, the air there and the climate, the, the warm climate, the, you know, in the evenings where you kind of go out in your t-shirt, all of the things that I miss so much in Germany. I mean, now we can do that with the climate change. Sometimes we have <laughs> warm evenings, but there are um, specific things in Georgia that um, I only find in, in that country simply uh, for me. And it's always a special moment. It doesn't matter how many years I haven't been there. And of course I left Georgia, I was uh, 12 and um, and still going back. It's funny because there are, there are times in my life where I felt maybe a bit less connected because I wasn't sure where I was, I belonged to which culture, more German or Georgian. But now, many years later, also I have my children who are half French, half Georgian living in Germany. I feel that the connection to Georgia has become more natural and more logical, more beautiful somehow. There is no more question mark underneath this kind of, yeah, this special connection to home. And when you go there, where do you spend most of your time normally? Uh, well, of course, uh, I'm, I was born in Tbilisi and we still have an apartment in, in, in Tbilisi, which I love to go back to. Uh, and, but it depends. I mean, for example, in Zinandali, there is this festival. You know about it because we have almost the same team as in Verbier <laughs> with Martin Engstrom, who yeah. have helped so much to, um, and Avi Shoshani, who helped so much to, to put this together with our friends in Georgia and going to Tinandale, it's also 
a real highlight because it's such a beautiful place. And so if you had to have, let's say, a last kind of Georgian supper, what would, what would be the <laughs> menu? Okay, you still want to know. I, I uh, must know. I, got, I need to make some Georgian food tonight. I need some inspiration. So. Oh, I have a very favorite. Uh, well, of course, I think the biggest favorite dish is khinkali. You know what it is. Oh, yes. my God, it's so good. This is it's, just unbelievable. It's mind-blowing. It's mind-blowing. <laughs> That coriander when it comes through, it's just. Yeah. Uh, then I love the um, eggplants with uh, walnuts. Mm -hmm. um, I love. I've been uh, trying to get that walnut paste right for about six months now. I can't. Really? I still can't. I, it's always too garlicky or too under. Really? Okay. Yeah. No, but Georgian, I must say, Georgian cuisine is not something I cook every day at home here, but yeah. I almost never cook Georgian food because. It takes a lot of time and you can taste it that someone has been standing there and working hard for hours. <laughs> it's always very kind of hard working, but it's really worth it. And so I, I, I love coriander myself. So I have any dish with it, like uh, whether it's chicken with coriander or the soup with coriander or all this uh, vegetables, uh, spinach with walnut sauce. It's so delicious. Of course, you know that. And, um, yeah, Khachapuri is very famous and worldwide now. Um, there is a there is a giant version of it with an it's it's, it's long uh, and with an egg in the middle, which is uh, I'm sure you have tried that as well. Which is, which my kids will die for. I mean, yeah, it's like yeah. a bread boat. It's a bread boat exactly with a lot of cheese mm -hmm. and an egg. I mean, super healthy. Oh, you're making <laughs> me so hungry now. Okay. <laughs> Um, yeah, I, I have tried that. Unbelievable. I have a, a kebab place around the corner from me here that tries to make it. It's a little depressing oh, here in Salzburg. Okay. Yeah. Go <laughs> back to Georgia for that one.